Hi, I am Xavier from Navy Recognition, reporting from DSCI 2017 in London, UK this week, one of the leading tri-service defense exhibitions. One of the highlights of the show this year is the Type 31 frigate program for the Royal Navy with several exhibitors showcasing their design on the show floor. The, the main thing that we're, we're showcasing at DSEI is our new Arrowhead 120 uh, light frigate design that we launched uh, today. Uh, and it's a, it's a design that's been created initially with a UK Type 31E frigate requirement in mind, but also looking at export requirements and customers we've been speaking to around the world. The ship's designed to be affordable, capable and flexible, and it recognises that Type 31 fundamentally is, is you know, dealing with humanitarian disaster relief, anti-piracy, some war fighting roles. And so it's been designed with flexibility at its heart. It's got large mission bays that can be reconfigured uh, depending on the, on the role. It's got a large flight deck and a hangar that's Merlin capable. Uh, it meets naval standards, so it has damage um, survivability built in. Uh, it has an emergency propulsion system in the event that you lose the, the main engines, uh, but it's not designed to meet shock standards. So it's, it's designed to be affordable and capable enough to put it uh, in a, in a warfighting role, but not, a, not as a frontline combatant. The UK government published their strategy last week. We've now seen the initial requirement for Type 31E. Uh, the key things for us now are our design is maturing quite well, we're undergoing tank testing. The next thing for us are to look at the partners that we would work with if we, if we decide to bid this programme, both mission system integrators and you, you'll see the UK are looking at that distributed build philosophy, in which case which yards would be involved in the build of it. But principally at the moment it's about making sure we've got the right design solution. We started working on the design about two years ago after it was announced in the SDSR. Um, what we focused on was the design of a full warship uh, frigate. So we've worked with some vulnerability experts out of a company called Survivability Consulting Limited uh, with the aim of basically producing a warship based frigate which is capable of uh, significant unmanned vehicle operations. Um, we've included various features in it to enable that. Obviously the big stern garage as you can see here. Um, port side of the hangar uh, for additional unmanned rotary wing aircraft so that they can access the flight deck. Uh, and then we've also done things on um, separate and redundant communication systems, separate and redundant operations rooms um, to allow for not only the survivability element, if we get hit in one particular place we've still got a reversionary mode or reversionary operations room, um, but we've also done a similar thing uh, with the uh, propulsion system as well. So we've concentrated on providing cost effective survivability. Uh, that enables us to basically um, downgrade it, should we wish. So if the customer doesn't want the survivability or doesn't want the cost, we can take that out. It won't change the design of the ship, which enables them to upgrade in the future should they wish to. 
um, but it enables them to yeah, get a good chip uh, for whatever budget they have. So I think the, the primary thing comes out of this first Sea Lord Ted last Thursday, he wants a credible frigate. He's going to send these ships out for forward presence roles. So in those sorts of presence roles, as we've seen recently, there have been various attacks with anti-ship missiles on ships in the Gulf, for example, in what are deemed to be safe areas. That's a, an issue that the Royal Navy has faced for a very long time. So what they need in that is a credible warfighting ship, a ship that's capable of taking damage should it have to, um, but will protect the guys on board and also you know, get, give them a chance to get home, repair and you know, get the ship out there and fighting again. So right next to me here, here at DSEI 2017, is something that we call Venator. And the version we have here is Venator 110. 110, 110 meters. So the whole concept of this, the whole architecture of this, is to be relatively small, but very, very capable. So we're very excited that we've got a candidate here, not only for the world's navies, but perhaps right at home for us here, the Royal Navy. As I say, this is a design approach. So you can have Venator minus, you can have Venator plus. And we do know that we don't want to send the wrong signals to navies that say, yeah, but that's, that's, that's either too expensive and too much, or that's not, that's not good enough. So we're very alive to certainly two navies who we're in good conversations with who want something a bit bigger something a bit more capable. This might be their major fighting vessel. So we have a version of this that is 10 meters longer with a more sophisticated propulsion system, longer range, faster speed, and quieter to be more optimized for anti-submarine operations, for example. So we have here a design approach with all sorts of flexibility depending on what your Navy really needs. We do know that the United States is launching its FFGX program. And the United States is saying they would welcome ideas from around the world, particularly from Europe. So we're very excited to say, well, would you like to have a look at Venator, for which we already think you, don't, you might not be interested in Venator 110, but maybe Venator 120. You catch me at the show right now, having just announced that we are striking a partnership with Babcock here in the UK for the Type 31E program for the Royal Navy as we em embark on this very exciting process of what's called a value management process, um, where we'll be interacting with the Royal Navy, with the Ministry of Defence, as we offer this design and indeed Babcock's design, two different designs, as we start to explore, well, which do you prefer? And maybe you like a bit of this, or maybe you like a bit of that, maybe we can bring it together. So we're starting in a very exciting position with two potential starting points. But right now we don't know where the finishing point will be because that's what's so exciting about this program, working for the Royal Navy, is how we'll how will we converge on a winning solution? We've just launched our next generation wave glider, uh, specifically targeted at handling uh, high sea states and longer duration missions and higher latitudes. The, so the Next Gen Wave Glider was extensive research and work that we've done over many years of missions in high sea states and high latitudes, and it's specifically designed to handle sea state six or greater, uh, and we've designed it where we have now 15% more power that gets generated from our solar capability, and about 40% more power that gets stored in the batteries, uh, and about 30% more weight that we can carry on the platform. So it's about making it a more capable platform. The other thing that we'd like to to talk about is the coating that we put on to the wave glider itself, the paint. Uh, it's copper-based, so you can see an example here. 
Uh, and when it hits the water and, and stays in, depending on where you are in the world, it'll have different times where it oxidizes and then gets a patina finish. Uh, so from a coloring perspective, uh, it's very stealthy or very hard, low absorbable uh, from a color and so therefore difficult to see in the ocean. So one of the benefits of a, a wave glider being a mature platform and us bringing out the new version of the technology is it can stay in a fleet environment. So we can put out dozens of wave gliders as a, as a continuous fleet. And we have a, a concept of operations where if you want to maintain 365, 24-7 presence for acoustic monitoring, as an example, um, we'll have hot spares that are swimming outside of that grid. And then they will swim into the grid and replace um, one or two wave gliders at a time on a rotating maintenance basis. And all you have to do is pull up the wave glider, clean it off, tighten some bolts, put it back in the water, and then it rejoins the grid. And then we'll, we'll use those hot spares to move on to the next one. So we maintain a constant field. So as a client, while each individual wave glider may be six months or so without having to touch it, you, you want a grid that's 365, 24-7. So you don't want to have to ever have your presence or capability go down. So we maintain that at a, a high state of readiness. Showcase for the first time at DSCI this year is the Dragonfire in a full scale. It is a new laser weapon system. This is UK Dragonfire. Um, it's a UK technology demonstrator program. Um, uh, run by a consortium of UK companies to deliver a high energy laser weapon system for the UK MOD. Dragonfire is made up of a number of companies including uh, Kinetic, provider of the high energy laser source and some uh, coherent beam combining technologies. Um, we have MBDA who provide the command and control system uh, and uh, they are also the prime for the program coordinating the companies. Uh, Leonardo, who provide the beam director, which we can see here, uh, including sensors and control steering of the beam. Dragonfire is a high energy laser weapon system uh, we use to deter and defend against threats um, at, at a distance. The uh, system can be used in a number of ways, for example, to knock out uh, sensors on uh, potential threat systems or to um, take down swarms of UAVs, for example. Lockheed Martin unveiled the new LCS 125 meters. A company representative explained that this concept is representative of Lockheed Martin's answer to the U.S. Navy FFGX requirement. This new ship is based on the Freedom Class Littoral Combat Ship, or LCS. The frigate measures 125 meters in length, compared to the 115 meters of the LCS. Its crew complement is 130 sailors, compared to a crew of 65 on the LCS. The scale model features 16 anti-ship missiles, likely Lorazum, 8 forward below the bridge and 8 more aft on top of the helicopter hangar. There are also 16 Mark 41 VLS cells for ESSM and or standard missiles. The main gun is a BAE System Bofors Mark 110 57mm as per the RFI. There is a CRAM launcher on top of the helicopter hangar as per the RFI as well. Other additions when compared to the baseline LCS include two CWIP EW antennas jammers, four Nulka decoy launchers, two remote weapon stations and two fire control radars all located on top of the main structure.